Hello everyone and welcome to Pushing Positivity on the Pier, where we introduce amazing people, take a deeper look into their story, and share how they're making positivity actionable each day. I'm Josh Schiller and today we have taken the show inside, but have no fear. The rhyming book reviewer is here. Welcome Tony Mosey. All the way here from Boston, Massachusetts. Correct. What was that ride like? Long. <laughs> why are you here for the weekend? Let, let everybody know why, uh, why, why, why you're in town. Okay, well, there was a wonderful event going on. It had all my favorite authors and entrepreneurs, Richard Branson, Gary Vaynerchuk, Simon Sinek. I mean, the whole list. There was Amanda Cerny there, who's a former bi biner and now YouTuber. So it just, it was a really good event. What was your, what was your best takeaway from the event? Um, it's about the people. It's about having empathy, really like channeling that EQ, that emotional in intelligence. You know, really like in order for anything, whether it's an idea or a business, you have to, you have to understand the people. You have to give back to the people. It's all about selfless, selflessness. Giving back to the people, about the people. Before we talk about the people, let's talk about the person. Let's talk a little bit about Tony Mosey. So I know originally born and born and raised in New York. Correct. By Yonkers, that, that area, right? Mm -hmm. And then we moved to Connecticut. Mm -hmm. How old were we when we moved to Connecticut? 14. Okay, so right around the high school? Yeah. Right around high school, middle school? Yeah, high school, middle school. Did high school, Connecticut. Yep. Went to college? In Connecticut. In, in Connecticut. Yep. What did we study? So I was a psych and a sociology, you know, psych major, sociology minor. And then I finished off at Central Connecticut State University with my master's in psychology. Why psychology? It took a very awesome professor. Diving deeper, I would say, probably because I was born an only child. My parents divorced when I was nine years old. I lived with my dad. He didn't really, you know, he wasn't really around. And he gave up his parental rights because he just couldn't take care of me. He didn't know how to. Um, and then I moved in with my, my mom and my stepdad. My stepdad, you know, we didn't have really a good relationship in the beginning, but through time we did. But um, I found myself roaming around the streets when I was, you know, living in New York and living with my pops. Just, you know, here's this 11, 12 year old just roaming like the inner city streets where it's dangerous and crime is high, you know, in the section of Yonkers I was living in. So, I mean, you know, it was, it was, you know, it, it got me wanting to learn more about myself and how I could definitely, uh, you know, grow from the experiences that I had. I just remember a lot of hours either spent in the house alone at the age of 9, 10, 11, or out in the streets just aimlessly walking, sometimes dodging certain neighborhoods where, you know, you could have been shot, stabbed, you know, beaten. So, Paul, so I went to uh, uh, Enrico Fermi School of Performing Arts, and that's where I got to learn my craft of acting and playing music and all that stuff. But then I went to John Burroughs Junior High School, and that was a really tough time. Couldn't even concentrate. This was you now. Know, this was in Connecticut. This was in. This was once again like I'm. Uh, the experiences was basically the sequence of event was elementary school at Enrico Fermi, then junior high school at John Burroughs, and this was both in New York. And then when I went to high school, I went to Torrington, Connecticut, moved in with my parents, you know, my mom and stepdad. We went up more north, and I went to high school in Torrington. Okay. So for four years. And then, so then we get done with high school. Yeah. Now, how, Connecticut was a little di bit different than, than New York, right? A lot. It was a big transition because, number one, it was no longer inner city. It was like a rural, suburban area. And it went, and the shade of color of skin went from dark to predominantly light to skin color. You know, um, and people, when I first got there, people were like, yo, there was like, you know, the word was around, like, this guy's from New York. Oh my God. It was, Watch I felt like I was, I would felt like I was kind of a, you know, like not a king, but like I was being hailed at because like, you know, like, cause I'm coming from New York. Yeah. They're like, yeah, this is New York. He's from New York. Oh, he has more style than Instant us. Instant street blah. cred. Yeah. You know, so it was cool. Like coming in real quick. But then through time I started seeing like the different culture, like, you know, just even socioeconomic status coming from like poverty when my dad was, you know, collecting welfare check and now you're coming up into an area where people are making at least, you know, 80 grand and up, you know, and their lifestyle is different and the streets are clean and crime is lower. You don't have to worry about, you know, having to worry about either getting uh, beaten up or killed. 
So I mean, it was it was a big transition for the for me for that that first year. So you know? we go through that time right yeah. in high school. Mm -hmm. We've had, had a little bit of a good time in high school, right? I mean, of course. So then we wind up going to college, staying in Connecticut to go to college. Right. Right. We wind up encountering a, a freshman professor who's totally changed your outlook on, on mm -hmm. psychology. Right. Right. And now now you're really committed to it. So let's talk about college a little bit and that experience. Sure. What was that like? So actually, you know what? At the age, I'm, I'm going to just move back just a, a little bit. At the age of 17, my mom thought that I needed to be in the United States uh, in the military. And so she was having the military, you know, Marine recruiter come over, active army, army reserve, Navy, like all these people were coming over, you know, trying to like get me to sign up. Finally, I did. I did it for the sake of my mom at 17. Um, and I took a semester off so I could attend basic training and my job training. I was a truck driver hauling fuel in the United States Army. Um, and then I went to school that second semester. Thank you for your service, by the way. Yeah, you're welcome, yeah. Much appreciated. You're welcome. Thank, uh, thank you for, <laughs> for honoring that. Um, at, at school, I found out on campus, a lot of kids were getting average GPAs of 2.0 and below. I think because of my military, you know, the, the training that I was getting and the conditioning and the culture that I was in, it allowed me to focus a lot better. So instead of getting below a 2.0, I was getting actually above a 2.0. 2.9, you know, that first year at that Southern Connecticut State in New Haven. And then um, when I, and then 2003, we got called up to go to, you know, Iraq and Kuwait. Um, it was January when we got activated. So I know I had to start taking the semester off by December. Uh, from Southern, served in Iraq and Kuwait from March all the way to December of 2003. Once that was done, I came back to Connecticut and went to school at Central Connecticut State University in New Britain, Connecticut. And so there was when I was able to finish off with my bachelor's. So we go from being raised in the streets of New York to now going to a more suburban area in, in Connecticut fitting in there, right? Now also having some military experience, right? Going to basic training, now going back to school, and now going to war, basically. What was that transition like? So, I mean, I was, how old was I then, 19? I spent my 18th birthday in basic training, and I spent my 21st birthday in Iraq. So, I mean, I was one of the youngest ones in the unit. Everyone else was married, they had kids. Some of them had several kids. Um, so all I had was me. I mean, obviously I had my family, but I didn't have like a generation of, you know, I didn't have a family to have to worry about who depended on me, sure. you know? I was still in a sense a dependent. So how do you think that made your time over there different than someone, someone else who, who, who had kids at home? It made it easier. It made it easier to, to get through it because I didn't have that burden. People were, seeing these guys crying for the fact that they missed their kids and not going to see their kids for whatever amount of months. You know, they, some, some like, are missing, they were missing their child, child's first birth. So you didn't miss being back home at all? It's funny because when I was there, I was in the zone. You know, every experience has definitely molded me. And that one right there, because I'm thinking if I didn't serve, there's a lot of, lot of different directions. If, I didn't, if my mother didn't decide, hey, I see that this kid is not doing well. Like, when what I was, was her 12. What was her metric for that? So people around town were telling her that your son is roaming the streets. He has no new clothes on. He's just looking really bad. And like my clothes were all ripped up, you know, and you know, I was out on the streets till two in the morning as, as a 12 year old. Um, and people were starting to say, tell her like, you know, you should take him because he's really, his this dad is, when is not. You were, you were living with your dad? With my dad, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, you know, they were saying, like, yo, he's not doing well. He's, like, his clothes are really messed up, and he's, he's out in the streets till late, like, past midnight. And, of course, kids are, like, you know, picking on him, and he's just not, he's not doing well. And in school, he's, like, almost going to stay back a grade. I think you should take him. And I think if my mother did not take me, I would have been, to be honest with you, the statistic of any African-American, Latino, inner-city kid. You know, either in a gang, because I figured that was my only friendship that I could have secured, or my only family, or I would have been dead, or I would have been in jail, because I was starting to cause a lot of mischief, a lot of tension was, you know, going up in me. It makes so much sense, like, the whole psychology of it, like, 
a dad who is not physically or emotionally present. Uh, kids are picking on me. Uh, you know, I had no direction. So what, what could I turn to? What was my only resource? A gang, yeah. being in a gang, because that would have been my pseudo family. That would have been my protection. All that thing would have been the sequence if I stayed just for another year or so. Yeah. I was on that brink, but fortunately, my mother picked me up, so allowed me to take another, take me a detour into a different direction, and I'm thankful for that. And then going into the military and serving in Iraq, Kuwait, also helped me steer because I still noticed that before even getting in the army, I still had like no, I didn't have a clear idea of what I wanted to do. I was like very immature, and I think like the army definitely helped mold me. You know, I still, I'm still a little goofy. I love it. I love having fun. I laugh. I love to goof around. But I do notice that because of this experience, because of being in the military and serving overseas, it has allowed to take that, that uh, you know, it allowed me to be a little more clear yeah. with myself and more self-aware and all that stuff. So fast forward past, past the military experience, mm -hmm. right? We get back home now. Mm -hmm. What's life like at this, at this point? So right, right when I get home, so right when I get home, I go, I, I go to Central Connecticut, stay with my parents for a couple years, um, and complete my bachelor's. Worked at a, work at Chili's restaurant. So we, took, we took time off from getting our bachelor's to, to be deployed. Correct. Now we came back and now we're finishing our bachelor's. Now we're finishing our bachelor's. Yeah, I'm finishing my bachelor's. Okay. Um, Living with my parents, working you know, at a restaurant. So I finished, finished off at, in, at Central with my, ba with my bachelor's. Took six years off. Because I got a new job that paid wonderfully for a after bachelor's. After you got your bachelor's. So after I got my bachelor's, within six months, I got a job working in a psychiatric hospital with children, adolescents, and adults. And I, did, and I worked there for 10 years. Why'd you do that? Why did I do that? Because I figured I went to school for it. And, you know, I figured that's the trajectory of where to go if you went to school. But I knew that I wanted to get my PhD in clinical psychology. I was going to be a clinical psychologist. So right after my, right after my bachelor's degree, I actually was applying to PhD programs. So working in a hospital would have gave me, given me so much credibility so that I could, you know, be able to get, you know, better accepted into these programs, you know. Um, but I worked in it, did it for 10 years. Actually, it took me six years in between to figure out that I wanted to go back to school because I was just enjoying the pay. It was an amazing pay. The field actually doesn't pay well, but for, for, for what I got, I got paid really well. And I was traveling around the world at least three times a, uh, three times a year doing hip hop, um, you know, make, you know, kiss, shaking hands, kissing babies and all that stuff like that because of it. So you're doing hip hop while, while working at the hospital? Yes. The, you know, the fact you, you could accrue PTO, you know, allowed me, you know, I was working crazy amount of hours, which then allowed me to leave for like two to three weeks at a time. And, you know, uh, and if I wasn't overseas, you know, I'd be home writing, what, what were your recording. What were your aspirations on, on the music level at that point? I wanted to be signed to a level, I mean, to a record label. I wanted, I wanted record label status. So what were the steps you were actually taking to, to bring that dream into reality? You were actually traveling? Like, what were you doing with the, with the hip-hop? In regards to hip-hop, yeah. so I was networking a lot uh, when MySpace was prevalent once again. I had posted my music up on MySpace, which was wonderful. You click on that link, and then that box came up with yeah. all the music. And people would hit me up. They would just be randomly surfing on MySpace, and they stumble over my stuff and be like, dude can you like collaborate with me? And I'd be like, well, if you give me a place to sleep, I'll come out there. And they're like, oh yeah, fine, sure, let's do it. So was it a culmination of points or was there like a specific event that happened where you woke up and, cause you were doing the things with the music and you were doing things on the professional front at the hospital. How long were you kind of just building those parallel lanes before you kind of woke up and were like, what am I doing and, and how do I need to change this? So, I mean, I've been doing rhyming book reviews for two years. Like August 2015 was when I came up with the idea. However, there's a lot of things that led to that idea. And it started when I was nine, when I was at Enrico Fermi School of Performing Arts, learning how to play the alto saxophone, you know, playing, you know, being involved in music then, and then also acting. So drama is like things that I like to like do, the drama troops or whatever, acting, um, theatrical stuff. And um, reading books, I started reading, like my mother read to me while I was a, you know, from when I was an infant to all the way till, you know, they, they split, you know, my parents split, but my mother entered me into a summer book reading contest at the age of nine, where I read 14 books in one summer. And from then on, I became very voracious. Like I had this big appetite 
for wanting to read books. So I just kept reading books since then, you know, and I was reading a lot of personal development or as they would call it then self-help books. So I was not only learning about psychology on a, on a academic level, but also a personal and then also professional level. So playing music, reading books, rapping at the age of 14 was when I first picked up a mic and started rapping over beats and everything like that. Traveling around the world for it. And then it took, I think it took a breakup. I was with this girl very briefly, but it, it, it hurt me then, like for at least for a couple months. I was really like shattered by it. And a, a female colleague at my job noticed that I was like pining and really like it really was bothering me. So she recommended me this book by Thich Nhat Hanh. It's called I Am Here, Discovering the Magic of the Present Moment. And after reading that book, it changed my, the way I, I looked at life because I was always like dwelling on the past and everything. So this wasn't just even with the relationship. It was other things. I was worried, too concerned about the past and too worried about the future when happiness and everything that, that happens in your life is in the now. And I became very mindful, went to Norway, went to go visit friends. They were busy, which was good because it allowed me to literally stop and smell the roses. And I got into meditation. It really, that, that book... Especially, that was like the pivotal moment. What, what time period was this during? This was 2000 and, um, 2015, January. Um, two, that, well, 2015 was, yeah. How long, how long were you working at the hospital at that point? So I, I started working there May 2007. Yep. And I worked all the way till 2017. Okay, so, so just try and put all these things in order. So we've we know that the skill sets and the experiences we've been through all the way going back to nine years old has led to you know doing the the rhyming book reviews mm -hmm. but again now we've been working at the hospital for some time mm -hmm. right at what point when you were working at the hospital were you like i want to pivot maybe even away from doing music but not really because rhyming rhyming book reviews still has a musical element to it right i guess where did that where did that third option come from i took a hiatus from hip-hop um, I was seeing a therapist, uh, a, veteran, a veteran guy, he was my therapist, and he was telling me, like, especially during the time when I broke up, when I, you know, when I broke up with that, uh, when, I was broke, when I broke up with that girl, he's like, dude, he goes, I noticed the one constant in your life that makes you so happy is rapping. Why aren't you rapping again? Why aren't you writing music? Why aren't you recording? And I was like, hmm, okay. And I hop on YouTube, and I'm looking at book reviews, just regular book reviews. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. People are in front of a camera talking about a book. And I think because of my experiences starting from when I was nine with reading books voraciously and of course rapping since I was 14, that I don't know, it just clicked in my head at that moment when I was looking at book reviews because I love books so much that I wanted to rap about them. Because I've always been a topical type rapper. I always rapped with topics and themes and stuff. I always told a story. Yep in my songs. How it's supposed to be. <laughs> and so here I am, you know, at least 2015 is when I started, come up with the name, Tony Mosey, the rhyming book reviewer, Tony Mosey. Something that everybody could understand, everybody could just say. I like it. Yeah. So we've, we've, we've now had this awakening moment, right? Where it's like, all these pieces add up to this total logical lane that now you, you can see in your head, right? But you're still working at the hospital at this point. Yes. When, when all this is, is coming to fruition in Correct. your head. So once, and I always like asking this, so once you've had that clarity now, then what are your next steps? So um, what got me to quit my job after working 10 years was I got back from Norway, did the, started the Rhyming Book Review. I was reading a lot of business and entrepreneur books, and I still do. I love business and entrepreneur books, personal development books. And... Somehow, you know, I got into this whole idea of visualization and affirmations, especially because I was, you know, I was getting out of that whole, you know, the breakup and the grief and the loss of all that stuff like that. Um, but I was still, I was about bettering my mind and the stuff like that. And I was getting into, like I said, visualizations, affirmations, and all the other different personal te of development techniques. Somehow, some way, I attracted this couple who sold life insurance um, and... She sold me a life insurance policy, but also got me, also recruited me to be in the agency. And I got into entrepreneurship, like even deeper, going to the seminars and going, you know, going on webinars, 
reading even more books, connecting with CEOs, connecting with other entrepreneurs. And I started seeing the whole idea that like I could actually, like the nine to five is not something that I have to do for the rest of my life. So one day, you know, seeing, I was calculating all my odds and everything like that, measuring out the pros and cons. I did that real briefly. And I said, you know what? I think I'd be better off without this job. So fortunately I had some money saved. I had like, you know, like maybe five months saved the money. And I said, F it, you know, I, I'm, I'm quitting. And that's the thing that people need to also remember. Like, you know, in the entrepreneur world, or especially if you're watching these motivational videos, and, and, and sometimes I could grab onto it too, you hear these guys saying, why don't you just quit your job, just leave your job. But they also gotta reinforce the idea that there needs to be a plan. There needs to be, you know, a measurement of your pros and cons and really be like self-aware, like, you know, like really be be realistic and know what work you have to do. Because at the yeah. end of the day, like you could have the vision, you could have the best idea in the world. If you're not willing to do that work and not only envision what can go right, mm -hmm. but also be realistic about what can go wrong. Right. And not sit there like, oh, well, this can go wrong. Oh, I'm being so negative. No. What can go wrong? And what is your contingency plan or what is your plan to make sure that you can overcome that obstacle, whatever it is? So we, we've now decided to leave the hospital, mm -hmm. right? We have some savings, mm -hmm. right? What, what were those first steps like being out in the entrepreneurial realm of, of, of the world, essentially? I mean, I was already conditioning myself, you know, with the entrepreneur mentality and going about stuff. It's, but regardless if, especially when starting, it's a, and, and always, it's, it's always gonna be like that until you finally get to this point where you have enough money in your bank account because obviously money is one thing too to run a business and also for your own stability. But it's a roller coaster, you know, and it's not always as clear or as as set as you would think it'd be. Like you think, oh, you know, now I quit this job and I'm just going to be an entrepreneur. No, like there has to be a map. What like, was your plan? My my plan my plan was I mean was to to do the rhyming book review full time. You know, I, you know, it's the cool thing about it is, is that people appreciate it. And there's people out there who appreciate it so much to even pay me to do it. Um, uh, right now, I would say it's still not at the point where I want it to be, where I'm like, it's like full scale, you know, uh, revenues like crazy high and all that stuff like that. Right now, uh, it's 2017, if I'm allowed to say the date or the year, but I'm your brand new entrepreneur like I'm out in the game right now like in the beginning per perfect and all that so, so. So, so while we're still there I think it's very important for people to understand why it is that you're doing this in the first place so why 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 am I doing it well on my end I, en I enjoy it I love I love music I love hip hop and I do it because I have so much joy in books I love books like I have a passion for books and hip hop, you know, I have a passion for those two. And of course, acting is something that I, you know, I dabble into. And of course, I want to get better at it and constantly do more of it. But they, these are my passions, and I do it because I love it. And to know that other people out there are appreciating it too, like, is even better. So it's the passion. Edutainment. Yes, edutainment. Can you explain that a little bit? So yeah, I heard it once before, uh, but you, to break it down, edutainment, education. And entertainment and nowadays I want to say instead of saying I'm an educator or an entertainer I want to say I'm an edutainer because that's the new platform where we're going into nowadays you know I mean the, the traditional systems of school and work you know the, how we go about schooling and work are starting to change now the rise of entrepreneurship also has created that that kind of new modality why do you feel there's a there's room for edutainment because the way things are going, how we're processing things, uh, the speed of information and everyone's overwhelmed and our attention spans are getting shorter. And so to just deliver it in the traditional, to, 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 to deliver educational content in a traditional manner is just not gonna, it doesn't cut it these days. Like people don't wanna sit someplace and have to listen about something. They want to be, they wanna be captivated in some way. Like your best public speakers are captivating. You know, your best professors, they do something that lures you in. Like the people who, you know, the, the people you see on YouTube, these people are, they, they, they master the art of, of getting you engaged. 
you know, and I think entertainment is that form. It's that form of engagement, engagement, keeping your eyeballs and your ears glued to whatever is being delivered at you. For so books. there's there's a lot of noise out there. Yes. And from what I'm seeing and, and what really, why you're even sitting here today, apart from everything else, is that is your ability to cut through the noise. Right. Where can, where can you see this all going? Big vision. I'm very thankful I got, uh, I got accepted into a startup leadership program. The cohort of people who are in this program are also entrepreneurs building businesses, you know? So it's this wonderful, you know, wonderful uh, environment of entrepreneurs and it's teaching me how to go from the ideation process up to the scaling and eg exit level. Um, and right now, I'm, you know, because of this, it's pushing me to see myself building this as an actual business, like a legit business where I've scaled it and I have actual employees or staffing there. The idea would be to get people, get a cast, whether it's just your resident cast or just outsourcing, getting different kind of contractors on there, but getting a cast of people who would act in the videos, also getting other uh, musicians or artists to be part of these videos. Um, I mean, if, if it's the since I do since it's, and I don't want to say hip hop. I want to say it's musical and theatrical. So it'd be musicians and actors and actresses. All right. So, so now we we've gotten to the point where we're we're really manifesting all this. Right. It's all coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. we're, we're putting out the content. We're we're putting things out on YouTube. And what's been the hardest part about being a content producer? Well, it's it's this one idea that I remember, especially in hip hop thinking that you need to be a jack of all trades. I am involved in the front end, the back end, the marketing, the sales, you know, the promotion, the graphic design, the video editing, the audio editing, and now I'm slowly starting to outsource that. Because if I focus on all these things, I will never get content done, yep. or at least delivered uh, more efficiently, because I'd be too busy worrying about, all oh, this, well, this is not perfect enough, it's not ready enough, or this <laughs> is that and that and that. It, it, it's, it, it really holds me back. Yeah. For having it. That's why I love that book by uh, Jay Papasan and Gary Keller called The One Thing, talking about focus on your one thing, because that's people, you know, your most successful person did that. They came up with an idea and they, they focused deep. on it. They yeah. Went, they went deep within that subject and they, and they became an expert. Yeah. So what are you doing right now to sustain life? Why, are you generating income from the rhyming book review, mm -hmm. right, from the rhyming book reviews? Because that, that's the one day everybody, everybody always asks, right? They're like, mm -hmm. okay, well, sounds great, Tony, right? How are you, li like, how are you even living? Right, like, right. So I've once again had to, and had to dabble into a lot of different, like, endeavors. And, of course, working a nine-to-five job. You know, this job that I had was working part-time. Um, I was just, like, I had to put my two weeks in, and I was like, I, I don't think I'm going to be doing this, obviously, for a long time. So, yeah, picking up stuff, maybe driving Lyft and Uber, being very frank, driving Lyft and Uber to make some extra cash. I am C for events, so I make money doing that. Uh, but yes, my vision is to obviously get to the point where that's my one thing and that's my soul, or at least that's besides the passive income that I've invested in, of course, sure. with stocks and you know life insurance, life insurance, not death insurance, but life insurance policy and a couple other things. That's cool, but like on the more like uh, immediate end of yep. receiving income, like I want that to be like my one thing. That I'm getting. But you're willing to do whatever it takes right. that, until then. Right. And that's the thing too, right, is understand that when you're going for this dream or you're pursuing something that you have in your mind, at the end of the day, you don't need enough money to buy Ferrari, right? You need enough money to live. You right. need enough money for food. You need enough money to, to, to be at home. You know, to say you need enough money to go out, like, ask yourself, do I need to be going out right now while I'm, right? It's, and making that sacrifice. Right. No matter who I've spoken to, and correct me if I'm wrong, they've had to sacrifice to get somewhere else in life, right? You have mm -hmm. to sacrifice in that short term or that sometimes that short term turns into long term and that's when people wind up giving up, right? Yeah. Because they've been through it like, okay, well, I've been putting in this work for X amount of years, why haven't I got this? Right. When I always look, think about that, that, that uh, visual when the guy's digging for gold and he's like right there and he like gives up. Yeah. And, like, and the other side is like the treasure. And like, right. I've heard that so many times in my life from people that are like, the most successful people say that 
when they see other people not succeed, they were so close and they didn't even realize how close they were to succeeding when they gave up. Hmm. So I think with what you're doing and how you're going about it, you have the you have the exact right mindset in terms of listen, whatever I need to do to make this a reality, that's what I'm gonna do. So if we're sitting back here a year from now, what does life look like for Tony Mosey? Well, it'll be a good time because now I've built a better relationship with you. So I thank you for pushing that positivity. But a year from now, I would say, man, it's just, I find myself meeting more people, influencing more people, being in a more stable situation. Because right now I'm going through different plateaus. I'm leveling up again, like Mario Brothers, like Zelda. Um, and I'm, I'm really appreciating for the, this level up, especially at this time that, we're, you're, you, that I'm speaking with you today. Like, a lot of, a lot of, a big transition has happened where I moved out of Connecticut about, you know, several months ago to live in Boston because I wanted a different life for myself. Yeah. And during this time, there's a lot of transitions within that. Living in a house temporarily and now moving back more south to Boston and, you know, figuring out the Ryman book review, being part of startup leadership program, figuring, you know, how, figuring out how I'm going to make, you know, how I'm going to position this as a business. I mean, like as a real full-scale business, as opposed to just me as this one uh, freelance guy who's doing it all. Um, but things will be a lot more stable, and uh, I, I, and I see myself reaching out and influencing more people. So now, this is the the great part of the show where, if we didn't learn about you enough until this point, now we're gonna get the real sauce, right? This is a part of the show where we kick it over to you, and I think you're in a unique position because. Not only would I love to hear some golden nuggets that you've been able to learn or experience throughout your life that helped you on your journey, right? That you can convey to the audience. But also, we want to hear you rhyme. We want to hear you rap. We want to hear you review a book. So can we work on, on a couple of, of those things? Of course. Right. So let's start with, first off, just any words of wisdom that you have for the audience and anything that they can take into their day and, and make it actionable. Sure. So I believe positivity and how fitting of this show, positivity is everything. If you're, because negative, if you look at the mind, you think about negativity versus positivity. Those they found in research, those who think with a negative, a negative mindset actually access lesser parts of their brain versus those who have a positive mentality or a positive mindset where they're allowed to access all different parts of their brain. So I believe that positivity should be a regime that people should incorporate in their lives. I believe laughter is also a wonderful, great thing for health. I've done laughter yoga, which is amazing. It's not yoga, it's just basically laughing. And um, I really do believe like, like it's your mindset that's everything. So always looking up, always looking positively always looking towards success. So it's mindset and positivity are like the foundation, the foundation to growth and anything else that anything else successful in your life. Now, now there's two agenda items left. We got to hear you rhyme. By Norman Vincent Peale is called The Power of Positive Thinking. Just look at the bright side. Keep an open mind with wide eyes because good things happen to those with the right mind. Believe in yourself, never defeating yourself. And hey, yo, your mind is inclined to increasing your health. Keep the mind strong. Never thinking you're weak. Every hour there is power that is bringing you peace. Bless, stress, just give it. Expect the best and get it. Make goals and aspirations, and yes, you're winning. If you're feeling lost to wherever your visions be, here's a rhyme to prime your mind from page 63. Keep your mind free from hate and worry. Expect little, give much, and live simply. Fill life with love, be there to serve others. Treat yourself like how you treat a mother. That's the key to happiness. There's more to think that's real. That's 17 chapters by Norman Vincent Peale. Oh. So... If one would want to find Tony Mosey, where do they go? How do they get in contact with you? And who do you want to even contact you? I'm looking for authors. I'm looking for book readers. I'm looking for those who love music, hip-hop. Um, I'm, I'm 
my clients, of course, are authors, self-published authors. So I'm looking for authors. Any authors, you know, newly published authors, those who've had books and haven't seen success or want to just get their name out even better, you can hit me up, email tonymosey500 at gmail.com. Also, you can find me at tonymosey.com. That's my website. You can view my content also on youtube.com forward slash Tony Mosey. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter at Tony underscore Mosey. And you can find me also on SoundCloud and Goodreads if you want to track and see all the books that I've been reading or the books I've re I have read thus far. Well, that, that's where we could find you. And I know that we'd said before that there's two things left, but now there's really two things left. So first off, just thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for pursuing your passion, pursuing your contribution and everything it is that you're going for right now that not only empowers yourself, but also empowers others and shows others how it can be done, how you can go for it, how you can go for your dream. Mm -hmm. Not not just going with the status quo of what life is supposed to be, but really creating your own reality and, and doing the work necessary to make that that visualization, that thing that you're thinking about, right. ideation, right? Actually turn it into execution. Now really be able to build it out into something you can be proud of. So thank you. Finally, and you know, we talk about the importance of ending this show in the right way, and we do this every week, and this week is going to be no different. Mm -hmm. That's one of these. Hey. Have a great day, man. Thank you, man. Reaching positivity in hot proximity. <laughs> Man, I, what what rhymes with proximity?